My name is Michael Lengel. I'll give you all a brief background on myself and uh, then we'll dive into my presentation here, which is going to be geared toward uh, arbitrage sellers on Amazon. So a little bit about me and my background. I cut my teeth in my career in my 20s working in startups in growth marketing. So building support teams, building digital marketing teams, working with you know content, working with engineers for platforms. Uh, things like that, uh, most, notice, most notably um, Craftsy.com, which was acquired by NBC Universal in 2017, I believe it was, for $150 million. And I think through that process of working in startups, it's really set me up to, um, I think, be successful and bring that sort of spirit and mindset to Amazon because there are a lot of parallels with you know what we do on Amazon, of course, and um, just being an entrepreneur um, and growing a business and scaling a business, um, you know, from zero to, you know, in the case of Craftsy, uh, seventy-five million a year, and for us as Amazon sellers, you know, starting from scratch, um, you know, and and trying to build um, a meaningful business, which is again going to be the the kind of tone and focus of um, of this presentation. Um, after that, I ran a marketing agency for about six years and um, kind of put that on the back burner when I got into Amazon in 2020. Like a lot of people, I was part of that COVID cohort, if you want to call it that, when there was a lot of uncertainty and change, of course, and um, at the same time, a really rapid acceleration of uptake in um, e-commerce shopping, right? We're all stuck at home and that really accelerated things and on Amazon in particular. So we're gonna walk through what some of that arc looked like. I'm gonna talk about, you know, being an arbitrage seller and um, yeah, we might as well just dive in. So let's see. All right, I think we are good to go here on the presentation. So what we're gonna be talking about here today is mentality, mindset and scaling for Amazon arbitrage sellers. My business is called And 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 LLC. Um, I'm also co-founder of another business called Century Group, where we actually manage Amazon stores for high net worth individuals. Um, you may have heard of this kind of thing, you know, before. Uh, some, you know, describe it as uh, Amazon automation, but really, there's not that much that's automated about it. It is, you know, a pretty intense process to run uh, a successful. Amazon arbitrage store. Um, but again, that is something that we'll talk through as we get into the slides here, how you know we sort of built our team, our systems, our process to be able to do that and um, launch that business century group to manage stores for, for individuals. Um, and then our business, our main business and and, and LLC, which I started in, in uh, a little before 2020 is you know where I started my Amazon journey. And then, you know, kind of got into um, some of, I think, what's a very natural extension for myself, which is trying to help and support others. I really care a lot about helping, you know, entrepreneurs um, find their feet, be successful, learn, you know, from my experiences in the startup world, running a marketing agency, agency uh, and then, of course, you know, operating in Amazon. So let's dive in. So what we're going to talk through um, you know, I'm going to try to hit these points um, pretty quickly because we've got limited time, but we are going to have uh, Q&A afterwards. So I'm going to pop right from this presentation into the virtual booth if anyone wants to join there for a live Q&A with myself uh, for about, you know, 45 minutes or so. Um, so what are we going to talk through? Amazon since COVID, arbitrage versus other strategies, limiting beliefs, your path, your journey, mindset, scaling and talking some resources before we get into that Q&A at the end. Um, you know, I think depending on who is tuning in here, you know, some of you may be really experienced, some of you may be just early on in your journey on Amazon. So I think it's always good and helpful to, you know, uh, get comfortable operating through different time scales and levels. So what's the big picture what's the macro what's happening you know with the global economy with the supply chain all these things that affect 
you know, what we're doing on Amazon day to day, um, regardless of what your strategy is, but especially for arbitrage sellers, uh, these, you know, different, um, you know, kind of um, changes really impact us and it's important to monitor. So let's dive in. So Amazon since COVID, um, you know, prior to COVID, e-commerce was, I think, around 13% of retail um, total. And Amazon was, you know, up to about half of that. And then on Amazon itself, we know that, you know, about 50 to 60% of the um, online sales are driven by third-party sellers like us doing arbitrage, um, of course, also, you know, wholesale and private label as well. Um, you know, in 2020, obviously, as people are getting, you know, um, shut in during lockdowns and everything, that really just drove a lot of acceleration of online shopping. And I think, you know, being an arbitrage seller, it's been really interesting to see how that was a major tailwind for a lot of people getting started. And then in the years since, selling on Amazon has become more difficult. And we're going to talk about limiting beliefs later and mindset and how important that is. But What's interesting is if you look at this, you know, slide and, and kind of this arc, what happened? We had, you know, lockdown driving a huge, you know, acceleration of e-com shopping. 2021, we had, you know, retail starting to open back up and people actually starting to shop in stores more. I think whether they just wanted to get out of the house or, you know, go digging for better deals um, or if that's just their shopping preference, probably a confluence of all those things, right? But in his last, you know, um, uh, shareholder, you know, letter, um, Jeff Bezos was talking about the value proposition of Amazon, right? Before he left, um, you know, his role as CEO, he was talking about the value proposition, which is that, you know, on average, um, Amazon can save the U.S. consumer about 40 minutes on a shopping trip. Um, you start to stack, you know, one shopping trip after another, after another, you know, and 40 minutes each in time savings. And there you go. That's the convenience and value prop of Amazon, right? Uh, with prime, you know, delivery and the convenience to shop millions of products and, and get them, you know, quickly and easily delivered to your door at a good price. Um, but you still had people going back to retail in 2021. I think by 2022, we saw, you know, really the ramifications of the supply chain shock as everything was, you know, messed up with deliveries. And, you know, if you look at, um, again, the macro and the big picture, you know, there's um, kind of a political and, um, you know, economic theme around reshoring and bringing manufacturing, you know, from, you know, Asia um, and China specifically to, you know, other places that are, that are, um, cheaper and easier to produce or even just closer to home as there's been more and more activity in manufacturing moving to like Mexico or computer chips with the Chips Act, things like that. Um, so again, I think it's just, it behooves any of us as uh, uh, Amazon sellers to be paying attention to the macro and looking at these trends and thinking about how they're going to affect our business. Um, in 2022, part of that reset was just the fact that a lot of retailers were getting seasonal orders late and then stuck uh, holding, you know, seasonal inventory until the next year. Um, or, you know, maybe they had more or less of, you know, what they wanted. But the point is that it created a lot of chaos. And in some cases, they just literally didn't have the physical space to store those products. So put that through the lens of an Amazon arbitrage seller. Well, all of a sudden you had, you know, your Nikes, your Kohl's, you know, your Macy's, all these big box retailers heavily, heavily discounting their merchandise. Um, and so you had people who were maybe having success with arbitrage in 2020, 2021, thinking, wow, this is great. This is easy. All of a sudden, you know, facing some headwinds where, okay, you've got consumers going back to retail anyway. You've got uh, retailers heavily discounting their inventory just so that they can clear it out and reset. And then all of a sudden, you know, you have some headwinds. All the while, a lot more Amazon sellers were entering the market as people were looking for maybe a side hustle, some side income, uh, maybe, you know, trying to transition out of a full time job, um, which has been the case actually for quite a few mentees who I've worked with 
who've been able to um, transition from an office job and start to focus on Amazon full time once they saw that they could replace their income. So a lot more competition, discounts from retailers, overstock from retailers. 2022 was not an easy year to be doing arbitrage on Amazon. Um, but I think what we're seeing now in 2023 is a bit of a rebalance. So, you know, if you spend any time on on Twitter or social media, TikTok even, you know, there are a lot of influencers and people who are trying to make Amazon arbitrage seem easy and straightforward, and it's not. Um, and I think, you know, some of those people who came in um, maybe late, uh, thinking that they would catch some of those tailwinds from the, the COVID surge in e-commerce uh, buying activity, um, just found out that it's hard, you know, whether it's customer returns or just operating the business. Um, but you know, it's, it's not super simple. And of course we all know that Amazon is very serious about the customer experience. And so, you know, you can't neglect things like, you know, your shipping times, your account health, all these different factors, um, even where you source your inventory to make sure that it's legitimate. Um, and so I think what we've seen is that, you know, some people who, um, basically, you know, are cut out for it, are getting shaken out a bit, and um, that can be a good thing. So I think, you know, 2023 and going forward, the name of the game is staying in the game. It's just like a trader, um, you know, trading stocks or something like that. Like, you know, if you can preserve some capital, if you can stay in the game, make sure that you're not going, you know, all in in one area um, and, you know, live to see another day, then great. And what can happen a lot of times if there is any, you know, kind of economic slowdown, there's a lot of ambiguity this year, is that, um, you know, players who stay in the game can actually consolidate their position, gain market share, and sort of springboard in the next, you know, um, bull market, right? And so I think that's what a lot of us can can focus on, and we'll talk about more in a few minutes, um, you know, learning staying alive and um, using this as an opportunity to get good, find our edge and niches and basically outcompete, I think can actually serve any of us really well as we um, as we kind of get through any of this economic, you know, kind of uncertainty and take a view into the future and how we can scale our businesses. So let's dive further in. Um, this chart just shows exactly what I was talking about. Obviously, we saw you know a big peak there in 2020 um, as people started shopping online more, and that kind of lasted through most of 2021. Uh, and then we maybe saw a little bit of a dip. And you know, I think right now the question is, um, do we just kind of revert to the mean where you know things are still trending up and to the right? Um, I guess I'm reversed on my little. <laughs> uh, screen there. Um, but things are still trending up and to the right. And, um, you know, there's going to be more e-com adoption and more spend. So we want to be, you know, getting better at what we do and they're along for the ride. So even though there's been some pullback, you know, the trend is still, of course, up and to the right. Um, so it looks like this last label might be hidden a little bit by my um, picture here, but, um, uh, let me go back here. Uh, there we go. Um, so arbitrage versus other strategies. I think for anyone who, you know, uh, is just kind of entertaining whether to get into arbitrage, this is how I view, you know, the, the pros and cons. I think, you know, um, private label is high risk, high reward. You've got production costs, you know, production timelines. You've got, you know, the the effort to set up your listings, optimize your listings, drive traffic to your listings, you know, get comfortable with pay-per-click because you're probably going to need that. Um, so I think it's more upfront costs and, um, but, you know, high risk, high reward. I mean, if you get, you know, a product that lands, you can really, really do well for yourself. On wholesale, it's interesting because I think as arbitrage has become more competitive, uh, a lot of chatter has been, you know, bubbling up about wholesale. And I think it's easy to think that that is a panacea for scale, but the reality is that you know the type of sellers who have solid wholesale relationships are very well established. They have big bank rolls, and you know it it can present its own you know kind of risk when you're buying deep on products that you know um, are dependent on you know you having predictable competition and predictable pricing because 
generally speaking with wholesale, you know, you're dealing with um, lower margins, but you're trying to make it up on volume. So you have to have good relationships with your wholesale, um, you know, distributors and accounts. Um, you have to show that you can, you know, spend meaningfully to actually get to the kind of discounts that are going to make it work for you um, and for them to take you seriously. And then, of course, you're going to have to be operationally sound. So either with a really solid prep center or your your own, you know, kind of warehousing. Um, so this is why I like arbitrage. I think when things are changing and, you know, things are competitive, one of the main benefits, of course, is that, you know, you can glom on to products that are already in demand and we can use tools like, you know, I use ASIN Zen as our, you know, analysis tool. Um, along with Keepa and others to, you know, be data driven about what you're buying. Um, make sure that these are products that are in demand. Identify where there are supply gaps and you can, you know, go source that inventory. And again, provide that convenience for the customer. So you're saving them that 40 minutes on their shopping trip because they can just log into Amazon, find what they want to buy, order it from you. Boom, good to go. And I think the flexibility and agility of arbitrage is something that, you know, just really appeals at least to me and that I really ad advocate for. So if you have, you know, a competitor who's knocking off your private label product, that could present an issue. If you have Amazon saying, hey, you need to submit some documentation or, you know, a bot caught up, you know, a listing for some reason, like uh, a word that triggered a pesticide flag or something like that, you know, your cash flow could be disrupted. I think with arbitrage, the beauty is that if something happens and you know a product that you're selling well and selling successfully, something changes, you can just pivot and adapt to selling something else. And another quick word I want to share, um, you know, this is uh, from a newsletter that I'm subscribed to, talking about something that's just been happening on Amazon more, which is that there are a lot more knockoff brands and products. And, you know, you may find um, like for Lululemon, all these random, you know, kind of alphabet soup brands um, that are offering similar products. So that can happen to private label sellers that can happen on name brands. But I think, again, when we think about, you know, the value prop for the customer, if they're maybe they try some of those cheaper products um, and knock off brands because they are just focused on the utility. But I think one benefit about arbitrage is that we're dealing with brand names. So those brand names already have trust and we can come in and be providing, you know, uh, products that the customer can trust and believe in so that we avoid some of this stuff that, you know, the um, New York Magazine was talking about here, this junkification of Amazon, um, you know, with, again, those alphabet soup kind of brands and products that, you know, who knows if they're safe, who knows if they're quality, they're cheap, and that might appeal to a certain kind of, you know, consumer. But again, for us in arbitrage, we can leverage big name brands, identify supply gaps, and get in there and make our dollar and make the customer happy because of the convenience factor. I think a word on limiting beliefs is really important here because as I mentioned, you know, we manage Amazon stores for high net worth folks who don't have the time to learn Amazon itself. And so we can use our team to manage that for them. One of the limiting beliefs that we come up against, um, and even amongst, you know, established arbitrage sellers is, can I really scale this? You know, if you're hunting and gathering, picking up a couple units, you know, in a purchase here and there as you test into something, um, you know, I and the communities I'm in and mentors I've had always preach going wide and not deep um, until you find an area of opportunity, of course, and then you can kind of, you know, progressively go deeper and deeper um, as, as sort of a risk management hedge. But, you know, the question is, can I really scale arbitrage? You know, can I buy the volume of products? That's one of the reasons why I think wholesale appeals to a lot of people. Um, but the reality is that I know eight figure sellers who are purchasing one, two, five units of a product at a time and just going super, super wide. Um, there are other hurdles that you know you can come across. Some retailers are anti-resale. Um, they'll cancel orders, you know, um, and and try to block you from purchasing from their site. They may know, you know, a prep center address and, and ban it at that level. Um,
All right. I think I'm not sure if that's on my end or not, but uh, apologies for that interruption there. Get back to the right slide here. Okay. So um, the question is, can I really scale arbitrage? And, you know, I think competition and, and saturation are questions that are always going to be there um, around, um, around Amazon. And um, yeah, all right, there we go. Um, and so, you know, the reality is that you can, you can find your way. Again, that's where data and the tools, you know, um, really, really do the job. Um, you know, in terms of time and efficiency, I think there's a lot around uh, tools, building a team um, and things like that, that, you know, um, some people, you know, see just the, the heavy lifting uh, that it takes to do arbitrage. But um, again, this is where getting connected with a good community, I'm going to have some info on that um, at the end here, um, can be really key for helping you um, understand where you can remove yourself as a bottleneck in your business as you're scaling. And, you know, when we're talking about the numbers here, um, it's really not that much that it takes to get into the top couple percent of Amazon sellers. So I think, you know, a lot of Amazon sellers, you know, sit down here at kind of, you know, the 100K a year uh, revenue range. Um, and, you know, again, I think the right community, the right tools, the right mindset, and you can really get to um actually the top couple percent of, of sellers um it's more attainable than you think your path your journey i think this is just a word to realize that you know all amazon um sellers you know have different priorities right for some it's a side hustle others they're ready to open their own warehouse um you know you see a lot on social media in particular you know big orange bars and big numbers and things like that but some of those people you know may not even have necessarily profitable businesses um and you know i think the reality is that you know when you get with the community when you talk to other amazon sellers you can really make sure that your business is working for you um rather than you just you know working for your business and and having it you know lead you um there are ways to scale i think that's the kind of thing we can talk about in the q a and, and connect more on later but um i think it's really important to be confident and assured in making Amazon work for you and finding your own way, not getting caught up in the hype, you know, that you see from other people and big orange bars. I think the number one competitive advantage and actually the, the number one quality that we hire for when we're growing our remote team is mindset. There's a lot of challenges in Amazon and, um, you know, I just think of every single hurdle, every single frustration is a place where somebody else quits. And that's where having, you know, a really strong mentality and mindset and drive can actually set you apart just by showing up. And there's a little photo of David Goggins and anyone who knows him knows that he's all about that mindset. Um, and it's really just about incremental improvements. You know, if you improve 1% every day, um, that really, really starts to add up over time. Um, and again, just by showing up every day, I think that um, that sets you apart already from your competitors. Um, and then I love this quote from Tim Grover, who was a personal trainer for a ton of, you know, world-class athletes, including Michael Jordan. Uh, but he says, pressure is a privilege, right? It means someone believes in you and gives you the opportunity to do something extraordinary. And I think that is a great uh, framing for what Amazon is about, because it's not straightforward and it's not easy. But if you lean into that, you know, um, pressure to, you know, figure things out, deal with account health, deal with, you know, fussy customers, things like that, you can have a really amazing opportunity for yourself. This is just a quick slide on scaling, um, you know, some of the basic steps I think that, you know, you can take on your journey. Um, you know, once you start to feel pressure for your time, like what are the right kinds of things to start to outsource or delegate? I think Prep Center uh, is the first obvious one. Um, for actually, you know, preparing your products and getting them shipped into the uh, fulfillment centers. There's a lot of admin work around coordinating with the prep center. Um, and there's a labor arbitrage aspect of this as well. So myself and a lot of colleagues are hiring folks, um, you know, from overseas, a lot in the Philippines, for example, where we can pay them actually a really great wage, equal or better than certain white collar jobs. Um, and they can help, you know, take some of this heavy lifting and day-to-day -day work 
They can work on it overnight while you're asleep and you can wake up and focus on the things that are actually going to help you scale your business. Um, so prep center to admin, to sourcing, um, to buying, you know, all of that just creates opportunities for you to focus so that you can pivot from being the operator to the owner operator. And over time being the owner who's responsible for resources and direction of your business. So there is a path and there is a pipeline to be able to really scale this business, hire remote employees and get a lot of the busy work delegated out and managed by, um, by your team. So wrapping up, uh, I tried to, you know, kind of blitz through the, the last bit there as we're, um, we're down to just a couple of minutes and with that internet interruption, but, um, yeah, in terms of, you know, resources, um, we've got our website where we're, you know, um, we're just starting to step out into the open with, you know, some of the tools that we've built to help manage our team and manage multiple stores, you know, about a dozen employees and, um, you know, offer some services. We provide like leads for Amazon sellers. Um, I do a lot of, you know, mentorship, um, you know, with, with folks who are looking to scale or maybe starting their first business and they just need some guidance and some help, whether it's, you know, how they actually organize their work, how they do goal setting, how they measure, um, you know, key metrics for the business, um, you know, just lots of different things like that, that I think come with uh, some of my background and experience and, and maybe not everyone has. So uh, I would definitely welcome everyone to, you know, reach out, check out our website. We're going to be adding more, you know, on there over time. In terms of community, I actually think this is the biggest takeaway. Um, if you go to our website, you know, click on the community link and find your way into, you know, a community like Arbitrage Ops. That's where I learned. That's where I connected with tons of successful sellers and just learned so much. Um, and to have that support system um, in practical ways for things like account health or different issues that come up for referrals to great partners and prep centers and things like that. Um, it's just really, really key. So I highly recommend you guys um, go to our site and, and, and .io and click community and check out our ops. Um, and then there's another one as well called uh, Arbitrage Empire, which is more focused on mindset, uh, which is equally uh, as important you know, to be successful in this space. And then if you want to reach out to me, get a consulting call, talk about mentorship or just connect, uh, of course, you can do that as well. So there's a contact section where you can email me or my email is right here, just michael at and, and, and dot io. So with that, I think we're actually right on time. 